So I want to ask you about Asia. The, these charts that you would have for a Steely Dan session like this, would this be an involved chart? Or would there just be the basic kicks? You know, it was, I, I, the form was there. You yep. know, all the sections were there. I just remember trying to come up with parts that, that work musically. I think that we got through the whole thing. And, you know, when we got to the end the first time, I just played do, 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 do. We didn't. I didn't know that they were going to put a solo over it or anything. And, uh, but, and I think that this is where they had a problem with other people, it was when it got to the end, they wanted it to go, comp they wanted it to shift to go some, completely somewhere else. Yeah. And, you know, if, back in the day, if you were called to do sessions, you know, that were pop things, the last thing you wanted to do was make it so crazy. Right. You know what I mean? You're yeah. trying to make it cohesive so people can understand it. So it was just hard to understand how crazy they wanted it because it was sort of a separation musically from what we had been trying to do, which yeah. was really, you know, orchestrate that arrangement in a way where it really felt good, you know what I mean? And then, and we had done that, but so to, to leave that and go to this other place was, it was hard to, uh, to to understand that that's what they wanted. I mean, it's almost like you you go over the top, and 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 you know you go you you don't know what, anything else to do, so you go the other way, and that's what they wanted. They yeah. wanted that kind of uh, that kind of crazy. But it's hard to explain that. Yeah, you know, if the solo's not there, but I, I and I think that that was. Uh, the, the communication problem that maybe w they had with other guys. There's really not a tune that's like that either. That's a really unique song with a basically a drum solo and a sax solo going on at the yeah, same time. Yeah, for that period of time. For that period of time is very unusual. And uh, But you could tell that those guys loved, they, they came from a, a jazz background. Yes. But they also, you know, knew about, they were smart and intelligent and used music to, to make a living, you know what I mean? And, um, and they were good at it. Yeah. So, and so they brought a couple of different genres together in that song. Yeah. Are you surprised at how this is, this, you know, has lived a life on its own, this, this drum part? I mean, it's crazy how much, uh, um, uh, notice how, how many people heard this song and, and and talked to me about it. Yeah, I mean, unbelievable. I'm, yeah. I'm extremely fortunate. What was your uh, drum setup at that time? If if you were doing sessions and you were in town in L.A., hey, I'm here. Would you have a company that would bring a cartridge company bring your drums, a particular drum kit that you had out in L.A. That would bring it to the studio back then. What, what would what was your setup during this period? How, what was size drums? Were you playing your recording customs then? Some people had the budget to where you could car, get your stuff out there. Mm -hmm. A lot of studios had uh, like a house kit or something. Well, yeah, they had bass drum and tom. Yeah, and and and, and then you'd bring your own uh, pedals and seat and snare drum and cymbal stands and cymbals. Yep. So that could have been that. Would you always tune your own kit though before you, when you got there? I, that I was, yeah, you know, in those years, yeah. Yeah. I bought some different gear when I got out of the army. Okay. I bought a set and I, I, I experimented with different heads, uh, you know, I, so I learned a lot about, um, you know, tuning from building that set myself and from trying different things. You always you played with a lot of the same players throughout your career. There, you know, these, these guys that would be on that would do sessions all the time. And were there people that, and you don't have to name people. Were there people that you would be like, oh, I'm psyched that they're on the session that I get to play with them because I really connect yeah, with a them. A lot of time in the '70s, I mean, getting called to play. You know, it's like. A lot of times, the artists that were were uh, had deals. I, I didn't know who they were, but I knew all the sidemen that they were hiring, man, right. like uh, Will Lee or Chuck Rainey, Gordon, Edward, Richard T, Paul Griffin, uh, Frank Owens. Uh, you know, you, I, I, all the Spinoza, Trope. Those being able to play with those guys was even. Uh, more exciting <laughs> than, the, than the artist, you know what I mean? 
<laughs> well, I, you know, because I didn't yeah. know they were young artists. They didn't sure. know. Some of the artists were, were, weren't were that experienced. They were talented. Yeah. And they, they, they were on their way to, but they, the musicians were, could help them along. And those musicians, while they were helping the artists, helped me learn how to help the artists. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, the, 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 the stars of New York for me in the 70s were the, the guys that I wanted to do sessions with, you know. Would you always know it was you if you heard a song on the radio and you were playing drums? No, no, not always. I mean, if I knew if it was a hit and I knew I played it, I would know. But sometimes, <laughs> I would say, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't realize because well, it wasn't like I was trying to do something for myself. I was letting the music dictate what I was supposed to do. So it was less personal. Steve, what do you do for warm ups and things like that? I know that you have. You have a rudiments or a gadiments. Normally before a gig, you know, I'll, I'll, I got these sticks with, and uh, um, with rubber tips so I can play on a, on a counter or on a table in the dressing room. And, and, uh, and what I would do, I would just go, uh, Just some rudiments. You know, things like that. And I would do that before the gig for, you know, 10 or 15 minutes. And then go to play the show. And then uh, when, when COVID happened, and I had, we had all this time. I figured, well, I gotta. I don't wanna. I don't wanna let time. That, a lot of time go by, and not do something. Sure. I don't wanna have to fight coming back. Yeah. You know. So I, I started j just doing that little ten whatever I did before the the show, but there was no show. So you know, ten minutes would turn into an hour, two hours. And um, before I knew it, I was back into you know practicing again, and I started. You start writing new, these things yeah, down. Yeah, new things, new ideas, and sticking started to, to come to me just from you know just from being in that zone, and uh, and I started to understand about displacement. Mm -hmm. So, and once I got into that, it opened. Uh, it's like everything that I practice now. If you know, if I displace it, it 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 explain becomes. That. Explain well, all that. right. So here it's like. Here. You know what I mean? It's yeah. like one, two, three, four. That that's the same thing that I did. Same sticking. The, the same sticking. But you just displace you it displace where you started. And every time you displace it, yeah, it's like you're. It's like completely different. And, yeah. And so. But not in a way where technically, you're, it's technically the same, but mentally. In the brain. Everything, all those beats are in different places, so yeah. it's all new. Yeah. And when, and, and when you understand it, then these rhythms start to become comfortable. Yeah. And so it can, I think it's giving me like a, a, a new bunch of rhythms that I never thought of before.